From inside the hidden fortress, it's the IGN Digigods. So please welcome, won't you, two of the seven samurai, Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. <laughs> Oh, man. Bob, who is the hip author of that incredibly cool intro? Runer Erson Reed. Not his real name. Oh, yes, it is. Runer, thank you. Seven Samurai uh, intro always. Uh, any Seven Samurai reference gets us going. How you doing, Mark? Um, I am fine. I am trying to cue up me singing Wind Beneath My Wings at the Streaming Garage Telethon, which was last <laughs> Friday night. I, I, you know, honestly, I, I feel like I, I almost, there's a part of me that's like, oh, boy, you got out just in time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the thing is that, they, is that they asked me to sing. They, asked, they, wanted me to, they wanted me to sing Wind Beneath My Wings to Mike. Producer Mike from, from Stupid for Movies. Really? And the thing is that I didn't really remember the song. I, it came back to me as I heard it. Yeah. But, um, A, I didn't remember the song really. And second of all, uh, I can't sing. <laughs> but um, I don't know where it is. I'm trying to find it because I want you people to enjoy uh, my rendition of oh, uh, Wind Beneath My Wings. That was a long telethon. That was almost like... No, it was four hours. I, yeah. I was literally... I hosted a, a telethon, which you can see well. on YouTube. Which if you go to YouTube and type in Streaming Garage karaoke fundraiser you will see me hosting a fundraiser to keep stupid for movies and the other streaming garage yeah. uh, shows on for another season now it's not just four hours though it's four hours plus another 90 some minutes of, of an eagle of an eagle of, of, of a guy dressed in an eagle costume sitting uh, on the uh, <laughs> <laughs> now of course for our, our long time uh, our, our long time podcast uh Listeners, you guys, of course, are the OGs, the original gangsters. Oh yeah, of the Wade Mark. That's right. Uh, thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, stupid for movies is um, going to be going away, uh, most likely. Yeah. In fact, it's home in hundred. It's 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 a hundred percent if we can't get twenty thousand dollars by August second. It's going to well, go away. Yeah. No. Uh, it may come. And I'm producer. I talked to producer Mike last night. He may bring it back in some other form with a couple of other critics, but it will not be with Wade and Mark. Yeah, but, uh, you know, we are always looking for other ways to inflict ourselves on the world. So, um, that being said, we have a gob of DVDs to blow through today. Um, I just made a big announcement. You didn't care. The big announcement that Stupid for Movies is going away? Uh, that is true. Yes. Well, that is, there's a very, very, good chance. very, 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 very good chance that... Well, we're still here every week doing the podcast. Yes, the podcast, that's a good Lives point. On. The podcast will not go away. Lives on. It will live on. It's not going anywhere. We enjoy nope. doing it. We love doing it. It's all good with the podcast, but the uh, stupid for movies because we didn't get paid, the crew didn't get paid, we did every week for over a year without getting paid, which is okay, but once you start getting into year two of yeah. nobody getting paid, precisely, uh, it becomes a bit of a burden and we all have other things we have to do, and if we're not getting paid, we have to start weighing what we should do versus what we shouldn't do, Exactly. and so we decided to uh, that stupid for movies is probably going to go away, the last show being uh, whatever it is, I think it's July 28th or something. Well, there we go. Anyway, that being said, uh, we're going to blow through some, uh, some kid stuff and family stuff. It's the summertime. Kids are home. Parents are freaking out. They don't know what to do because the kids wake up and uh, they're not going to school. They have to be kept busy. So keeping the kids occupied. Hey, we're not done talking about the telethon yet. Huh. Because I had to sing at the telethon. Yes. Which was last Friday. Right. I, had, I was asked by Martha oh, S. Dear. Martha S. is a long time. Yes, long time fan. Stupid for movies fan. Yes. Hopefully she's a Digigods fan as well. Yes. Uh, Martha S. Hopefully you are. Uh, she had requested that I sing uh, "Wind Beneath My Wings" to Mike. And okay. here's here, here's a piece of that. Are you ready? Yeah, fine. You got one up. The heat. Here comes the chorus. Yes. Epic says Mike. Robinson. Wind beneath my wings. Sounds like a couple of drunk sailors. Says Mike Robinson. This is uh, this is good television, Mark. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Nice pipes. Wow. Oh my gosh. Good way to spend a Friday night. I hosted that for four hours. That's it was good. four hours of karaoke. You should send that to uh, Jerry Lewis as an audition tape because he's not doing his telethon anymore. I know. He needs someone to step in. That, that could be you. I know. Poor guy. Yeah. It's finally over. 
All right, we, we have some DVDs to talk about. We are uh, five minutes into the show. Oh, jeez. Okay, fine. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I'm going to bump the mic as I put it back into his little holder. Please hold. Hang on. Wait. Don't stop the recording. I'm going to put this back yeah. as daintily as I can. Watch this. Oh, uh, there we go. Dainty. I'm going to start off by just going through a, a bunch of uh, Scholastic titles that we recently got. Scholastic uh, Storybook Treasures does a lot of great stuff. As you know, they, t- they do a lot of uh, these uh, very inventively animated shorts that are usually based on popular children's books. Where the Wild Things Are is one of the better ones. But uh, they do a lot of other stuff, too. And uh, some of this is really, really fun. They're, all the, they're just shorts compilations. I'm Dirty and I Stink. Mark, this is the story of your life. Aww, Aww. how dare you. Uh, I showered this week. This is great. This is uh, two DVDs and 12 stories. And it's unbelievable the people who narrate these things. Uh, You know, Forrest Whitaker, Andy Richter. um, It's just, it's it's pretty cool. And uh, I'm Dirty and I Stink are, um, you know, well, I'm Dirty refers to one of the shorts, but there's a lot of other ones here. Uh, You know, I'm Dirty is one short. I Stink is a different one. It's not one. It's I'm Dirty and I Stink. But you also get stuff on here like the remarkable riderless runaway tricycle, which is great. Um, Bert Dow, Deep Water Man, is is really terrific as well. Uh, Fletcher and the Falling Leaves is really good. Uh, And Johnny Appleseed. We all know the story of Johnny Appleseed, right? Uh, the Paperboy, very, very good. Uh, the Beast of Monsieur Racine. I mean, just, it's really fun. The, I'm Dirty and I Stink is just a, a, a fun title. Whatever you say, Wade. And then we also have Good Night Gorilla and more wacky animal adventures. This is 16 different stories. Elle Fanning is one of the narrators on this. Uh, Danny and the Dinosaur, the day Jimmy's boa ate the wash. Isn't that funny? You've had a boa, haven't you, Mark? And he ate my wash. He ate your wash. Uh, pretty great. Um, the the Rain Babies, Zin 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 a violin. You know Zin 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 a violin. That sounds familiar. Oh my gosh, it really does. Yeah. What is Zin 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 a violin? It, it's a it's a it's a children's book. Oh, I thought it was some Hebrew thing. Nah, it's a children's book. Uh, wh- uh, what do you do with a tale like this? Do you remember that? Uh, I do not. Okay, Stanley and the Dinosaurs. T is for terrible. It's great. Um, also here is The Scrambled States of America, a uh, narration by Michael McKeon, among others. Lots of cool stories here. Uh, the Scrambled States of America talent show. Um, really fun stuff. Move. See, I'm moving along here quickly. Thank you. The North Star. This has five stories among the narrators here, Zoe Deschanel and Tim Curry. Zoe, great narrator, by the way. And Tim Curry, saw him on stage in uh, Spamalot. What a talent. Anyway, the North Star and more stories about following your dreams. This is lovely. Just really great stuff. Uh, My favorite on here is That Book Woman, uh, which is just absolutely terrific. Just, you know, there's something organic about this very painterly kind of uh, children's animation. And then, Mark, you're going to love this one. Uh, My first collection featuring Splat the Cat. Oh, I remember Splat the Cat. There you go. Look at that. Isn't that a creepy-looking cat? Stupid cat. This is uh, three DVDs with 14 stories on them, including narration by the likes of Catherine O'Hara and Laura Dern. And uh, my favorite one on here, it's such fun stuff to watch. My favorite on here is uh, The Napping House. If you want to know why, watch it. Rent it, buy it, whatever. Uh, Bear Snores On, Wild About Books, Duck on a Bike. Uh, Hondo and Fabian Picnic, the story about Ping, Goose, the most beautiful, wonderful, the most wonderful egg in the world. It's all great stuff. It's terrific. Any, any of this uh, Scholastic Storybook Treasure stuff, you've you got to look at it. It's, just, it's, a, it's art, and it's great for parents to watch with their kids, although I know during the summertime they'd prefer probably to just sit them down and let them do something so they can go away and play tennis. But uh, really, it's pretty great. Play tennis? Yeah, you know, parents want to play tennis during the summer, don't they? <laughs> do they really? I don't know. Play tennis, play golf, put the kids down. You know, put them down for a nap, leave the house, lock put, it up. Put them down the for a nap while the parents play. The plumber has come to visit. <laughs> the postman always rings twice until the kids wake up. Uh, Disney has a bunch of uh, DVDs called Have a Laugh. Now, yeah. uh, the thing with Have a Laugh is that these are based on actual vintage classic Disney cartoons. And they have been redone with uh, modern technology. Uh, which is unnecessary because the uh, early ones uh, look the best and are still the best, and I don't need to see classic Mickey Mouse and Goofy cartoons in CGI when we already have the originals. Um, we have uh, volumes three and four now on DVD, and uh, one disc set each, and uh, they, they call them remix 
M I C K S. Oh, Mickey Mouse. I get it. I get it. But bam. Remix. Uh, I'm not a fan of these because, again, I'd rather see the originals. Although, you know what? I have to say that Disney is a little remiss on, uh, on releasing all their classic. It is. A, it, you Mickey, know what? It's interesting. Um, well, you know what happened is uh, when Eisner was at the, at the head of the helm, at the helm of the head, um, they were releasing all those Disney, uh, Disney archive things in those uh, tin boxes. The, the Disney Classic Collection. Those are great. Stuff. Those are terrific. But then Iger took uh, took the helm, and suddenly those aren't coming out anymore. It's it's bizarre. Now there's no more Eisner, no more Roy Disney. And, well, here's uh, the thing, because they 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 probably they probably crunch the numbers and they realize how much they how many of those units they could sell as a DVD versus how many other yeah. how many other affiliates they could sell the cartoons to. You can sell it to Netflix and and Hulu and yeah, all these yeah, other yeah. crazy places. You can make money eighteen different ways on those Bad shorts move. as opposed to just releasing it on a DVD where you just buy it once. I'm sure that's what they figured. Bad move. Thank you. Anyway, uh, if you got a little girl, there's a, so a few options to keep little girls busy. Madeline and her friends. Uh, Madeline, of course, is one of the uh, is a classic book series and uh, semi classic cartoons. Uh, they've got six adventures in here, one of which is very dear to my heart. Now, Madeline and the Big Cheese and the Talking Parrot and the Missing Clown and the Singing Madeline Singing Dog and all. don't care much about those. But uh, Madeline and the Soccer Star, I'm all about it because you know what. As I speak, the United States won one of the most extraordinarily contested women's uh, professional soccer games in uh, in history, Ugh. beating Brazil. You know why it was contested? That because was some people thought it was interesting. It, no, and this that's was very contested. I'll, I'll, what? I'll just you say this. You thought soccer was interesting? I'll it's just contested. say this: the officiating this game was was egregious and quite possibly corrupt. Oh yeah. So uh, now, unfortunately, I have to root for the U.S. over France, and that's tough because those are my two favorite teams in the world. Anyway, Madeline and her friends. Watch Madeline and the Soccer Star. Also, if you um, if you still have any tolerance whatsoever for uh, the likes of well, it's not exclusively Dora, but uh, Summer Vacation is uh, is highlighted by Dora. Uh, this is a Nickelodeon thing, and uh, you get a, you get Dora the Explorer, Baby Crab, uh, Panchita and the Prairie Dog from Go Diego Go, which is of course a uh, Dora spinoff. Summer from Yo Gabba Gabba, the Hula uh, Duck Dance Party from Ni Hao Kai Lan, Wonder Pets episode Save the Hermit Crab, Save the Dolphins, and uh, Blue's Big Car Trip from Blue's Clues. If these shows mean anything to you, uh, you're going to love it. But uh, I saw the, um, the uh, Saturday Night Live spoof of Dora, and I can't watch it anymore. It's just uh, not funny in, in the wake of that. I didn't need to watch that skit to not watch Dora the Explorer. Uh, we have uh, two DVDs from the Yo Gabba Gabba people. You know, I don't like Yo Gabba Gabba because I hate all that stuff and I don't have kids. But Yo Gabba 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 is interesting because you know the history of Yo Gabba Gabba. It was developed by these two these two dads, these two dads who had no TV experience. They were just some that. random dads, and they were they didn't like the state of children's programming. They decided to create their own thing. Right. I'm sure one of them knew somebody because you can't get into a, a, you know a network executive office without right. some connection. Uh, but they got it made, and uh, "Party in a Box" is a uh, is a is a down dirty, cheap and easy compilation of three separate Yo Gabba Gabba DVDs: Clubhouse, Birthday Boogie, and the Dancey Dance Bunch. Oh well, there, there you go. Well, That's that it. Gosh, and then the other one is um, "Circus," which is a uh, compilation of four Yo Gabba Gabba episodes: Flying, Fun, Treasure, and Circus. So if you like Yo Gabba Gabba, then uh, you're crazy. Well, uh, rounding out Dora, we got a big box of play dates. Two. This is a sequel to the big box of playdates, the previous one. Uh, Summer Vacation, Sisters and Brothers, and we love our friends. We love them. Uh, this is, of course, a more of the same. Dora, Go Diego Go, Blue's Clues, Wonder Pets, uh, Nihao Kai Lan, the, uh, all the same stuff. And uh, no, no Yo Gabba Gabba in this one. But uh, you know what? It's, it's, uh, it's basically just a, 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 be- a greatest hits thing of all of these different shows. So it's more ways to keep your kids busy while you go and, uh, I don't know, play doctor. Okay, Wade, these two we're not talking about because I'm tired of talking about this kid crap. Okay. These three we are talking about. However, I have to – look at you. You're looking longingly at the ones we're not talking about. Spot's birthday party. No, we're not talking about Spot's birthday. No it's, but it's Spot. <laughs> but it's a birthday party. Yeah. Uh, what I'd like you to do is yes. I would like you to look at the cover of the DVD I'm holding in my hand. Yes. And tell me whether, just read the title out loud and tell me whether it is reminiscent okay. of, of, of another similar sure. property. Here it is. Chopkick Panda. <laughs> Chopkick Panda from the good folks at Good Times Entertainment. Chopkick Panda. Do you think... That's, th- that's a pretty innovative idea, like a panda that does martial arts? Yeah. That's wonder, a good idea. 
I, I, you know I'm what? I'm surprised nobody's done that before. There was a movie, I think it was called Cars, and it had a, ch- it had a panda. Uh, no, it wasn't Cars. No. Monsters, Chop- Inc.? No, Chop Kick Panda. Hmm. I'm trying to think. Secret of Nim? No. Pinocchio? <laughs> Wrong direction. I mean, how, shame, uh, how shameless is this? I know. It's, it, it's kind Chop of... Chop, kick, hand, <laughs> a fist of fury, and a heart of gold. This is uh, not worth talking about because they're rip-off artists. I just... I'm sort of astonished. I really am. It's amazing that they did this. Chop, kick, panda. Yeah, well, you know, they're thinking somebody's going to walk in and uh, oh, be, Kung conf- Fu panda. be the, confused. The, the, the DreamWorks thing. I like that movie. I'm surprised DreamWorks doesn't sue them. I really am. Is it, is it really worth it? Yeah, probably not. Too much in attorney's fees. Uh, Jerry Lewis, fl- uh, Fur Flying Adventures, Volume Two. This is uh, Jerry you, Lewis. I mean, Jer- did I say Jerry Lewis? You said Jerry, Tom, you said Jerry Lewis ten minutes earlier. Tom, Tom and, and Jerry, Jerry. Tom and Jerry, Fur Flying Adventures, Volume Two. This is a continuation of the Fur Flying Adventures uh, whole concept, which I don't like. Is I don't like these new Tom and Jerry's. Yeah. I just don't. I don't like the computer animation. I don't like uh, the comedy. I like. I barely like the old Tom and Jerry's at the time. Uh, I certainly don't like this. But there's a bunch of cartoons. Um, you know what? Don't play there you that. Go. I mean, come on, seriously. Uh, SpongeBob SquarePants Heroes of Bikini Bottom. This is uh, another compilation DVD from the SquarePants folks. Yours, Mine, and Mine. Crack Crabs, A Day Without Tears, Summer Job, A Pal for Gary. Keep Bikini Bottom Beautiful, The Bad Guy, Club for Villains, and Back to the Past. If that means anything to you, go ahead and rent this. Otherwise, there's plenty of other yo... Yo All that Gabba, jazz. Yo Gabba SpongeBob. All that jazz. Out there. You know, uh, the, the Chronicles of Narnia have been done a number of times, obviously live action on BBC, and people also don't realize there was, a, there was BBC animation in the late 90s, or late uh, 70s, sorry. And uh, Bill Melendez, who's uh, something of a successful animator, he was uh, belonged to a number of successful animation teams. Uh, they like to credit him with Fantasia, but it's really the Charlie Brown series that uh, Melendez was uh, significant on. He was the driving force behind this, and this is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the first adventure of that. And i got to say, it almost works better animated than it does in uh, feature film form. I'd rather watch this uh, cheap little animated bit from the 70s than I would watch that $100 million monstrosity that they released a few years back. Uh, There's commentary here with Bill Melendez, producer Steve Melendez, and the sequence director Bob Balzer. Uh, A deleted sequence, character designs, uh, some behind-the-scenes photos. And uh, you know what? I just I think it's really, really sharp. If you are a fan of the C.S. Lewis series, I would recommend that you pick this up. Maybe not to buy, but certainly worth a rental, for sure. Uh, Wade, let's talk about... Uh, let's, let's ease our way into real movies, please. Thank you. Jesus Christ. Sure. Uh, let's talk about a local phenomenon that uh, went sort of national. You know, Wade, uh, you remember growing up and watching Elvira's movie Macabre? Don't you? I loved Elvira. But, you know, Elvira was a ripoff, too. I mean, Vampira. Uh, anyone who's seen the uh, documentary that I produced that Ray Green uh, directed, Schlock, The Secret History of American Movies, we interview El, uh, uh, Vampira in that. And she started the whole thing. Uh, Elvira was really a ripoff of Vampira, except she just added a Valley Girl twist to it. That being said, uh, I love Cassandra Peterson. I think she's a fabulous talent, and uh, I always loved Elvira growing up. It was hysterical. That is true. Elvira's movie Macabre is finally being exploited uh, more robustly on DVD. Yes. Here we have a double feature presentation, The Satanic Rites of Dracula and the Werewolf of Washington. Uh, This is a little akin to the Mystery Science Theater stuff, only in that... uh, you show a really bad movie, and, <laughs> and, and a human is there to talk about it. But I prefer it this way because she comes in. She doesn't interrupt the movie until the commercial break. Correct. Basically, it's, it's she comes in and goes. Oh, da, 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 and then you get the. But the one you're holding, the, the volume you're holding in your hand has yes. two has two better movies in it. These are way better movies. Uh, this one has Night of the Living Dead and I Eat Your Skin, which is great. Night of the Living Dead is, of course, a classic horror film, as we all know. Uh, but I Eat Your Skin, you've probably never heard of. And uh, this is a voodoo thing, and man, it, it just... The only reason to watch this is for her commentary, because it is absolutely outrageously funny. Uh, Night of the Living Dead, you almost feel bad laughing at it, because it's, it's actually a significant and good film. But either way, Elvira rocks. She does, Cassandra Peterson. By the way, uh, I wonder, you know, Cassandra, there, there's, a, there's a, um, an apocryphal tale about Cassandra Peterson and Tom Jones. I, w- I wonder if that's even on the internet. I... I know where that's going. If it's Cassandra Peterson and Tom Jones, I know where that's going. And they didn't. They didn't. They didn't have uh, afternoon well, tea. Well, she was once a showgirl in Vegas. I'll just leave it there. Uh, well, Her here it is. Was, oh, actually, you know what? Uh, here it is. Uh, the rumor is that Elvira was um, uh, deflowered by Tom Jones. That is the rumor. Well, there's more to the rumor, actually. 
Uh, I, I won't. Uh, I won't. I won't go there though. She was working in the in a nude review in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. And she fell for uh, Tom Jones. All righty. No, so it's I'm, on the I'm, I'm reading it's this off there. of I'm reading this off of, off of GazaBrox.com. Peterson admits Jones was a rough lover, and her first time sexual encounter with the womanizing Welshman left her needing medical care. Uh, well. She tells the new issue of Blender magazine, "quote Tom seemed gentlemanly and nice, and so when he was jumping on me, I thought, well, if I'm ever going to do this, it might as well be with Tom Jones. It was painful and horrible." Unquote. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound very apocryphal. <laughs> well, Peterson I guess. tells Blender what? Peterson tells Blender she needed stitches after the sex session was over. But the worst pain was yet to come. She adds, quote, I thought for sure we were going to run away together and get married. I went backstage to see him the next night, but he was with two, uh, he was with two of his background singers and was all over them. I was disgusted. Wow. There we go. Well, I she guess it's stitches? not so apocryphal. It's I mean, out there. I can imagine where those stitches would be, but can you uh, put stitches there? <laughs> well, never mind. There. That's, that's, our, that's our story on Elvira, folks. Good night. Uh, we're going to blow through a few. Uh, we got a lot of stuff today to get through. I don't know if we're going to get through it all. But um, uh, Criterion has released a very controversial film by Mike Lee, Naked, which was a big deal at the uh, 1992 Cannes Film Festival, which was my first experience at the Cannes Film Festival. And uh, I did not like Naked. I was not uh, a big Mike Lee fan at the time. I was not that well-versed in his material. I have become a huge fan since. But um, I, uh, the, the film itself is very disturbing because it starts off with a rape and has some very caustic humor, and it's a very odd film. And it really, even by Mike Lee's standards, it's, uh, it's really out there. And uh, Katrin Cartledge is in it, who has since passed away, uh, which is very, very sad uh, because she was a lovely actress. That's, that, that makes it even more sad. But uh, Leslie Sharp as well. The audio commentary with Mike Lee and uh, Katrin Cartledge and David Thewlis, who won Best Actor at Cannes in 1992 for a very disturbing lead role, um, is very, very good commentary. Even though I'm still not a fan of the movie, great commentary. Neil LeBute uh, is interviewed as well, which makes a lot of sense because it's a very LeBute-like film, or at least similar to the tone of his, uh, his plays, which are always very button-pushing and uh, aggressive in their own way. Uh, the best stuff on here is uh, The Short and Curlies, which is a 1987 short film by Mike Lee starring David Thewlis. And uh, also has an audio commentary by Mike Lee. And then an episode of the BBC show The Art Zone w- in which uh, Mike Lee is interviewed. Uh, so really, it's, it's quite a good Criterion set, assuming that you like the movie. Very good transfer on Blu-ray uh, of a movie that's pretty grittily photographed to begin with. They preserve the grit but give it all of the attention that it needs to really bring out some of the, you know, the darks. It's a, it's a dark movie you know, in a lot of respects, and it's uh, shot in a shoestring. So it's, it's a, this is a great Blu-ray, even, even though I don't like the movie, I respect the release. You know, I'm kind of thinking more about this Tom Jones thing. It's really, how could you get, <laughs> here's the thing, if you can get, why would she get stitches in that area? And I'll tell you why. It's mm-hmm. impossible to get stitches. I mean, unless there's some horrible accident. You haven't been to a Tom Jones concert, have you? I have not. You see, you see, your good friend and my good friend Phil joined us for a Tom Jones concert when he played uh, several years ago at the House of Blues. And, of course, I and some of the others in our party, we sat a little bit back. Phil dropped right on down into the mosh pit. And uh, Phil was, was um, spitting distance from those painted on trousers. Phil could tell you. Ask Phil how he thinks the stitches were necessary. Well, here's the thing. As big as somebody's member might be, it is not as big as a baby. And a baby comes out of there, too. Yeah, you know what? Well, we don't need to get into this. But, yes, I hear you. (laughs) Wade, there's a movie, Wade. You know, when I was a little tyke, (laughs) there was this whole spate of uh, low-budget post-apocalyptic movies. that I just And I loved every one of them. I did, too. Even the worst of them. I did, too. And when I say the worst of them, I mean Damnation (laughs) Alley. (laughs) <laughs> Damnation Hell is from 1977, and uh, it's same year as Star Wars. It's the, <laughs> now. How is it that Star Wars became popular in this movie? Didn't oh, it's, it's unfathomable. <laughs> uh, this stars uh, Jan Michael Vinson. He plays his Air oh. Force officer, and uh, you know when he he detects like these Russian missiles incoming. It he, doesn't matter. He, he launches Doomsday. The world is destroyed. It doesn't matter. Giant scorpions. It's all you need to know. And he, I love that scene. And uh, so what happens is after the world is destroyed. They, the, the survivors set out in, in these huge Air Force 12 wheeled armored crazy tanks and they try to get across the country. And um, <laughs> it was a scene, <laughs> the effects were so bad. There was a scene where the truck pulls up into this big, vast desert wasteland oh, the and they, uh, they encounter this huge scorpion. 
Yep. I mean, literally. I mean, you know what? You might as well just hire Ray Harryhausen. That's just, true. Just, just to stop motion of the damn thing. That's true. It's just horrifying. But if anyone's going to, if anyone is going to create a good Blu-ray out of Damnation Alley, it is going to be Shout Factory. And God love Shout Factory. They <laughs> did a great job. Uh, audio commentary with the producer. Uh, Paul Maslansky, did Paul Maslansky, he has something to do with the Police Academy movies. Yeah, he was not? the producer of the Police Academy yeah. movies. Yeah. Um, and a couple, of, um, a couple of featurettes. God love Shout Factory. Damnation Alley They're just great. the worst. But you know what? It's a new widescreen transfer with 7.1 audio weight. Well, there you go. That is, that is really. If there's a movie that I want working on 7.1 channels, it's Damnation Alley. That is really overshooting the runway on that one, I tell you. Really, they, Damnation Alley would be fine on 1.1. Just, a, just one speaker and a subwoofer. Awesome. That's all you need. Speaking of awesome, Wade. Three years after Damnation Alley. Was? Battle Beyond the Stars. And this is also out from Shout Factory, awesome. thanks to the Roger Corman's cult classics line. I gotta say, this is the single best title they have yet released from the uh, Roger Corman's cult classics line. Awesome! Uh, this is the 30th anniversary special edition on DVD and on Blu-ray. Mark, uh, I think we're both rather fond of this movie. <laughs> it is. Uh, this was directed by Jimmy T. Murakami, who's really more known as a designer than anything else. I don't think he directed anything else, uh, and deservedly so. He's not really a director. But um, here's what's fascinating to me about this movie. It's not just a Corman film. This movie was an intentional... It, it basically, by 1980, you had had Star Wars, and you had had Star Trek The Motion Picture, and you had had Alien. And Corman was thinking to himself, damn, I got to get in on this thing. This, the, the space is all the rage again. And as I, Corman often thinks. As he often thinks, I got to get, I got to jump on the bandwagon. I know what I'll do. I'll do my own little deal on it. So he did basically a cheesy sci-fi variation on The Seven Samurai or The Magnificent Seven, depending which one you, you want to believe. And this, the spaceship, Richard Thomas from the Waltons, naturally was the choice here because he was the Tom Cruise of his era, wasn't he? No, not really. <laughs> not really. Uh, anyway, it's a very cheesy film. And uh, it's you realize that you, you realize that the, the 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 story before it shot, and and I'm sh- I'm sure well, I don't know if this happened, but you realize that that one of the trades initially announced this movie as starring John Wayne to be directed by Igmar Bergman. Yeah, it, it was that was like the original. I like, I'm sure it was obviously a joke. Yeah, but it got it got a bunch of attention got at the time, attention. and it was really funny. And uh, one critic at the time described the spaceship in the movie that Richard uh, Thomas flies as looking like a pregnant Enterprise flying backwards, which is kind of what it does. It's almost like it has breasts. It's a very odd-looking ship. But anyway, the... Um, hey, look, he- there's some great people involved. John Sayles wrote John it. John Sayles wrote it. But here's the big thing about this. This is the film on which James Cameron and James Horner met. James Cameron was the special effects supervisor, yes. and uh, James Horner... Uh, was the composer. And he was hired for the job only because he was able to basically rip off Star Wars and Star Trek music. He was able to do kind of a John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith fusion. And there, there you go. I gotta watch that. So, anyway. Do I want this? Yep. Do I want this? 30th anniversary special edition. Not really. Art, see, they even put on the sticker on the front, it's uh, art direction by James Cameron. They, 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 really? Anyway, lots of special features on here. Uh, two commentaries. By including John one, Sales. By John Sales Gorman. and Roger Gorman, yeah. Gail Ann Hurd uh, was the production manager on this, you know, another major name who was actually married to Cameron at one point, uh, more famous for her work with uh, on Halloween. Um, yeah, it's terrific. Lots of you know behind the scenes featurette stuff. It's pretty terrific. Radio spots. I mean, the movie's still crap, but uh, you know. it's awesome crap. It's awesome crap. It's the awesomest crap ever. Uh, Brazil is finally out on Blu-ray. Yeah, and but it's, uh, it's uh, not is so, it really out on Blu-ray. Not really. Uh, you know, here's the thing. Brazil is one of those uh, Universal titles that was once licensed to Criterion, and they did a lot with them, and they did some great things with them. And then they snatched all those licenses back and released crap versions of their own. Uh, there is nothing by way of extras on here. There is some beady live and pocket blue junk that nobody is going to access. It is a very, very mediocre Blu-ray transfer. And I would recommend, frankly, that you stick with your Criterion Collection DVD and, uh, and boycott this. It's nice to have on Blu-ray, uh, but... The well, cri- Criterion is they're really Criterion has on Blu-ray three anyway. different. They have three different versions in the Criterion uh, DVD. And uh, it's not Blu-ray, but it's, you know, the extras and all the stuff that's on it. It's much, much better, much more uh, comprehensive, especially considering the troubled history of this movie. Well, here's the thing. I mean, do, I wonder if this is going to mean that uh, that Criterion will not. Because Criterion is going back and re-releasing all their DVDs as Blu-rays. They're in the process now. But they can't release this but one on Blu-ray. they can't release that because obviously it's re- yeah. right. They'll, have to, they'll have to have an arrangement with Universal at some point, which I hope they do. Because other studios are starting to do that. Yes. And, and hopefully, yeah. well, here's the thing. It can go either way. 
hopefully nobody will buy this Blu-ray. Yeah. So when Criterion approaches them, they'll say, look, let us do it. We'll do it right. Yeah. Or the studio might say, well, we released it already. Nobody bought it. Why should we give it to you? Yeah. I'm hoping well. the studio says, take and do it right. Silent Discoveries is from the, uh, the Kit Parker Library, and VCI has the license to release all of that stuff. And uh, this includes After Six Days and Yesterday and Today. Uh, the uh, After Six Days, if you haven't heard of it, is a 1920 silent film. runs about an hour. And uh, it, was a, it was a hugely, hugely expensive biblical epic at the time. It was uh, considered to be the, the most expensive film ever made. You know, it all go, it's, it's basically the Old Testament on film. Um, and uh, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a, a mystery as well. The uh, original copy no longer exists, so this is transferred from a 16 millimeter. And uh, the film itself is, is a bit of a peculiar artifact because very little is known about it. And then the other thing on here is Yesterday and Today from uh, 1953. This is also about an hour long. And uh, this is a kind of a, a look back at the original silent era. Um, the, you know, kind of rare stuff here and there. It's, if this sounds like a hodgepodge, it actually is. This is clearly an attempt to take some things that Kit Parker had lying around in the library and didn't really know how to release or uh, market them. And uh, they throw it together in this little twofer that has, of all things, the, uh, the famous bullet in the eye of the moon shot from Melies's trip to the moon, which is not that significant and uh, uh, isn't really germane to this, but it catches your eye because you recognize it. So uh, it's, it's middling. If you can rent this, uh, you know, this, it's interesting. The, it certainly you know, has some kind of curiosity value. But what we really want to push is Buster Keaton's short films collection, 1920 to 1923. Yeah, yeah. this is Buster Keaton is prime. Kino has released, Kino, of course, has all the Keaton stuff, and they have released this on Blu-ray and on DVD. And uh, there are a lot of great shorts on here. Now, Keaton's features are the ones that people tend to really, really focus on because they are masterpieces. But there are, there are some really interesting shorts where he's honing his craft most of them from uh, about 1920, 1921. A few of these are from uh, 22 and 23. Uh, but the really good ones are like, you know, uh, Hard Luck, The Pale Face. Uh, the Goat is really famous. The Goat shows up on all kinds of compilation, compilations. The Balloonatic. Well, this has, this has the one where um, it's the famous shot where, where Keaton is standing in front of a house. Yes. He's, he's maybe 20 feet in front of the house. Yeah. And the entire front facade of the house collapses. And he goes. But he's to the standing window. in the hall in, in the in the hall where the window is. Yes, which which Jackie Chan uh, imitated in uh, Project A Part Two. Yes, that's in this collection. Yes, it is. It's Lo- a great collection. Maybe I do want this. It's Maybe a great this. collection. Maybe I do it's want got, this. It's got a lot of great extras on it. Uh, booklet, uh, visual essays on the uh, various locations in the film, um, uh, alternate uh, shots for some of the films, stuff from the cutting room floor. A 1922 film uh, with cameos by Keaton and Charlie Chaplin called Seeing Stars. Um, it's, he, he, here's the thing, though. It's really a, a great It's a great little collection. It is great. Uh, you know, I have to say that although all these shorts have been uh, remastered, they've not been totally restored. No. So they still have uh, marks there is and scars some and debris. marks on them, yeah. and some of these maybe were 16 millimeter yes. conversions. Or Very whatever. true. And Very true. So it's not perfect, but it's great. And uh, real quickly, a couple of films that uh, I think have some kind of nostalgia value. Glennis Johns looking. Now, look. Look how luxurious she looks on the cover of this. If you look at this Miranda. Oh, my gosh. Who is that hot woman? Look how gorgeous she is, that, right? That looks like that was taken from some golden age glamour era. But you realize who that is. That's that, Glennis Johns. Yes. Glennis Johns as in the mom in Mary Poppins. <laughs> Votes hot. for women. She's hot. Na, na, da, 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 petticoats that that Glennis Johns um, she's the ultimate catch she's in this with uh, Googie Withers and a lot of people you've never heard of um, Miranda is a movie from 1948 uh, nearly two decades before she wound up in uh, Mary Poppins so you can understand that she's a very different actress at the time um, and uh, what I find absolutely fascinating is that the film also stars David Tomlinson, the same David Tomlinson who would play her husband in Mary Poppins 20 years earlier. What the? Who knew, right? Who knew? 
Anyway, no, this is uh, this is an okay film from 1948. It uh, not great, kind of a programmer at the time, but it's a, it's another one of those little VCI classics that they uh, they like to release from time to time. And then uh, Sarah Miles is very very good in I Was Happy Here. Um, this is the Sarah Miles that I tend to be fond of because she was once married to Robert Bolt, the uh, screenwriter of uh, Lawrence of Arabia, and. Uh, <sighs> Everything comes back to Lawrence of Arabia. Always comes back to Lawrence of Arabia. And, of course, Ryan's Daughter, which she starred in and which Bolt wrote and uh, Lean directed. Um, This is a lovely film. A lovely little kind of uh, angry young man type film from 1966. Basically the travails and romances of a uh, a young Irish girl from Limerick uh, and, uh, you know, who goes to London and then back again. Limerick, of course, is where all depressing things in Ireland are based. It it seems like every time I see an Irish movie, they talk about, I'm a Limerick man. It usually means I'm an alcoholic who abandons my wife and children and make them live in squalor and misery. Limerick is just associated with everything horrible in Ireland, but... uh, this is a lovely film, beautifully photographed, uh, really kind of a nice discovery. So uh, good move here, VCI, good move. Um, let's do movies. Let's do movies. Let's do new movies, Wade, enough with the old crap. It's not much by way of new movies this week, i got to say. That's all right. We'll take what you got. Rummage through the pile. Uh, okay. I mean, nothing could be Damnation Alley. I admit that. Because in, 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 in Damnation Alley, they're, Tell oh, people. I like this movie. I know you do. I want it. Me want it. Can I have this? Yeah, of course. Yay. I was absolutely thoroughly delighted by Rango. I think Rango is awesome. Johnny Depp, Gore Verbinski. You know, there was something about Gore Verbinski's sensibility that's just a little bit off, but it's never not mainstream. I just think he's a smart filmmaker. Uh, frankly, the films, I've, the films of his I've liked the least are the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean films. I was a big fan of yep. uh, The Mexican and a uh, big fan of... I like of, Mexican. Uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, The Weatherman and yep. I'm a big fan of Rango. Weatherman's a good movie. It is a good movie. One of, Ni- Ni- one of Nicolas Cage's last actual performances. Yeah. Uh, Rango is with Johnny Depp and he's terrific, playing sort of a, uh, a, lizard, a lizardly riff on Hunter S. Thompson. And uh, he's a lizard who uh, goes to this western town that's dry as a bone and needs water and he's got to save the town folks. And I just thought this thing was terrific. Uh, DVD combo pack... Um, Deleted scenes, which you have to uncover. They won't stay. They, it's not like no. del- it's like it's it's almost like an Easter egg. But they tell you on the cover that you have to uncover the deleted scenes. And uh, there's a storyboard picture in picture deal, which is always, I guess, fun for two seconds. And um, it's good. I like this movie a lot. The picture looks fantastic. The audio is uh, quite good. And uh, there you go. There's also a new ending, a never be- a never before seen ending, which I will not give away. Uh, you know. It's not as good as the ending that is in the movie, but there you go. Anyway, Rango, highly recommend it. I like this movie a lot. Uh, looks great, sounds great. The extras are fair, and uh, there you go. It's Rango time. You love Rango. I uh, yeah, it's all right, whatever. You know, uh, this is a foreign film, and I, I should be talking about this with the foreign pile, but I'm not because it's it's a, it's a genre film, and I kind of I, I want to talk about it now. Uh, Rec 2, which is the sequel to the Mexican film Rec, uh, I'm surprised that they didn't release this in Blu-ray, to be honest. Uh, it should be, even though it's all kind of point-of-view video camera stuff. This is uh, kind of like uh, Blair Witch Project meets uh, 28 Days Later. They're all like, the, every one of those movies is all like, Let's, we can do this for $15,000. Yeah. I, I honestly, you know, it, this literally picks up just minutes after the first rec. And if you didn't see the first rec, uh, and rec stands for record, right, because they push record on the video camera. Uh, if you didn't see the first one, you're, you're going to be a little bit kind of confused. So I would see the first one if you're into these kinds of films. It's a point-of-view camera horror film. It's a news crew looking into a, into the, into a uh, quarantined apartment building. And uh, by the time this movie starts up, everything, all hell is broken loose, literally. I would almost say it's like, like a little bit of The Exorcist in here, too. It's almost, uh, you know, it's, it's supernatural. It's like, almost like a supernatural alien invasion, demonic possession film shot from the point of view of a camera, like uh, Blair Witch Project style. Does that make sense? No. Well, anyway, uh, look, it's got its moments. It doesn't completely make sense. But uh, it, is a, it is innovative enough that if you're into those kinds of films, I would say it's very cool. But I just don't know why they didn't release it on Blu-ray. It makes no sense. Uh, Dino Croc versus Super Gator. Who do you think presents this, Mark? Um, I'm thinking it's uh, Terrence Malick. Gosh, you know, you're close. But uh, no, that would be Mr. Roger Corman. And uh, it's funny how many films David Carradine continues to just show up in, like, what did he die two years ago? (laughs) 
Man. Well, he had to make those movies to afford he all those uh, yes. all those sexual accoutrements that uh, enhanced his oh, life. Until they oh, that's right. There you go. Oh. Show no respect. Anyway, this is just standard Roger Corman schlock crap. Uh, made well, this is the Blu-ray release of it, so this was you know this was made uh, relatively recently, but um, it hasn't been on Blu-ray, so now it's on Blu-ray, and you get to enjoy the uh, bizarre antics of Dino Croc versus Super Gator. Gosh, it's stupid. But it's uh, does, it Super, does Super Gator wear like a like a, a, a like blue spandex with a big red uh, S on his chest? I kept wishing and hoping that. Um, that like Godzilla would show up and eat them both, but he never does. Mark, did you see Miral? You know, uh, I did see Miral, and I didn't like it. I'm his. I'm a huge fan of Julian Schnabel. I, I am too. But I thought this is um, kind of a this is like a this miscalculation. Is, bad, is a total you know diving bell and the butterfly terrific. Before night falls, great Basquiat, mm-hmm. great Miral. What was he you know trying what? to do? What was he trying to do here? You know, the thing is, is that he went he went into it with the best of intentions, which wound up being its undoing. Yeah, it's less about the storytelling and more about he wants to make a point about the Palestinian suffering and how there's there's people who want peace on both sides, and you know he's trying to he's trying little, to a little too preachy. It, yeah, it's well intentioned and but almost too safe. I just yeah. uh, it's very uneven and I was very disappointed. In fact, I think a lot of people were disappointed. Yeah, no, everybody was disappointed. It, it, they, they, the Weinstein company basically kind of gave up on this film once they realized the critics weren't on board, which is par for the course for the Weinsteins. They did that with Miramax as well. But uh, I, I think there are some good performances here. I think uh, Willem Dafoe is 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 good, um, and I think uh, Frida Pinto is 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 good. But um, Frida Pinto is. I'm not on board with the Frida Pinto needs to be a superstar, incredible actress, and yeah. she's going to win Oscars one day bandwagon. I'm just not. Yeah. I think she's fine. She's beautiful and whatever, but. I don't think she's a great actor yet. You know who is really good in this and is it kind of underused is Haima Boss, the uh, Israeli actress. Oh, yeah. He's, he's, he, he, yeah, she, yeah. No, the woman. Oh, the woman. Okay, Haima yeah. Boss. Right, right. She, she is terrific. Uh, and she's been great in a lot of other things like uh, uh, Lemon Tree and you know, a few things that are not that well known here. But she is, uh, she is really, really good. Anyway, enough with that. You know, what I, you know what I liked? Surprisingly liked, even though it has huge holes in the plot and there are a few contrived things where you just roll your eyes and you go, oh, yeah, okay, right. Tell us, Wade, what did you like? The Lincoln Lawyer, Matthew what McConaughey. The? That's crazy. This is a Blu ray DVD digital copy combo pack, all of it on one thing here. And um, they got this dumb thing that comes with it, which is the, the, like there's a little barcode. Well, it's like a, a dot code thing that's on the, uh, on the packaging. And it says, scan this code for a sneak peek video. We, uh, Wemo enabled. Easiest one, two, three. Get the app at getwemo.com. Scan the code above using the Wemo app. View bonus in video instantly. How many people do you think are actually going to do that? Uh, zero. None. Stupid. But as for the movie, uh, the movie's uh, surprisingly good. It's like a really, really good uh, two-part episode of uh, Law & Order is what it is. And it's set in L.A. And I wish uh, you know, Law & Order L.A. had been more like this movie. It might not have been canceled so quickly. Um, Lincoln Lawyer basically is Matthew McConaughey as an attorney, a defense attorney who sort of works out of his car more than anything else. And uh, he's chauffeured around by this uh, guy who used to be uh, a client at one point. And um, it's a very, very interesting, twisty little scenario that he's involved in. It's a current case. It's a current defense case that winds up being impacted by a previous case. These two cases are end up being uh, surprisingly and inadvertently intertwined. And he discovers all kinds of things about himself that... As a uh, typical defense attorney who has absolutely zero conscience, he discovers that he has it now a conscience. And how does he cope with that? And how does he be a good lawyer and serve his client when suddenly he's uh, realizing that, you know, doing the right thing, doing the wrong thing may have the right consequences and vice versa? It's pretty interesting. Um, that also being said, it's uh, one of the few recent films set in Los Angeles, out of Los Angeles, that was actually shot here. Um, the uh, and it's nice to actually see a movie shot in L.A. where you go, hey, I know that freeway, I know that building, I know that street, as opposed to Battle L.A. where it all it's all Louisiana. Uh, directed by Brad Furman, who uh, is a very good up and coming indie director, primarily does crime stuff. Did a heist film with uh, John Leguizamo a few years ago, and uh, this John Leguizamo also shows up in this. But this is uh, this is a very very Solid film. It did surprisingly well at the box office, considering it got almost a zero release. 
uh, from Lionsgate. And uh, I, uh, I would say definitely check this one out and check it out on Blu-ray. Maybe not own it, but uh, it's worth, uh, worth a rental for sure. And then lastly on the new film front, Cowboy Bebop the movie. If you're an anime fan, you know Cowboy Bebop. Uh, it is a uh, it is a classic kind of futuristic crime uh, film that is among the most popular uh, vintage anime uh, titles out there, and uh, it is now out on Blu-ray and a very very good Blu-ray, I will add. Uh, Sony, of course, does they own the Blu-ray technology. They invented the Blu-ray technology, and uh, they did a very very good job on the uh, on the transfer of this. It doesn't have that. Uh, that kind of flat, starchy look that a lot of anime does when it's put on a Blu-ray. It's really very full, very lush, and uh, and very rich. So considering the age of this film, I am uh, surprised that it really looks this good. Wade, let me tell you something. Um, you think to yourself, God, straight to DVD. Yeah. You used to be just like the ghetto. The worst of the worst goes straight to DVD. Really, just the, wor- the, the lamest n- n- names of actors and writers and directors you've never heard of. Not the way anymore, Wade. Now I'm only saying this because it yep. comes. I'm saying this even though it comes out in September. But Wade, there's a movie starring Bruce Willis. Okay, Bruce were I Bruce know. Willis, I know. Ryan Phillippe, who starred in, in an Oscar-winning Best I Picture. I know, I know. And uh, Curtis uh, Fifty Cent Jackson, who continues to get work <sighs> on all straight to DVD stuff. This it's called Setup, and uh, it's it's Righteous Kill and 88 Minutes, which means I wonder if it's um, wonder if it's uh, Millennium Boy. Of course it is. I'm sure it's Avi Lerner. Avi Lerner. I mean, literally... Can you believe that this Mark... This is Bruce Willis and Ryan Phillippe. I mean, going straight to DVD. Mark Gill is now head of Millennium. I know. I, but here's the thing. Is that, could that be good? Uh, no, that's not could good. Could he turn it? Could? No, could, that's has, not good. So he, he has not been given a charge to turn that place around. I don't think so. I think Mark Gill needed a job. And, and I hate to say that because I, I think the world of Mark Gill. Because, you know, this is a guy who started with Miramax. Then was given the chance to run Warner Independent, but given no freedom to make creative choices. Left Warner Independent when they shut it down, which was horrific. Uh, started his own company just at the time that the world imploded economically. And like everybody else, obviously couldn't find the financing or arrange for the financing to keep his company afloat. And um, they had to shutter the company a few months ago, and Mark Gill needs a job. And I think Avi Lerner just saw a chance to... Uh, Kind of bestow some legitimacy on his on his junk, and uh, they're not going to change that place. What? I don't think that's a charge to turn it around. I can't imagine Gill saying, "I I am so happy I have this job." No, I, I my guess is that Gill is going to be there for the for the interim until a better job comes along somewhere else. Right. I don't think he's he's there for the long haul. I think he's there to uh, maintain some connections and just stay relevant and and do that thing. I hope so. Uh, I'm going to blow through this stack real quickly. This is the uh, the Miramax Library, as we all know, is has been divided between uh, Lionsgate and Echo Bridge for DVD and Blu-ray distribution. And the way that breaks down is that Lionsgate will release all the A-list stuff, you know, uh, Cinema Paradiso and Shakespeare in Love and all that kind of stuff, while Echo Bridge has the job to simply uh, blast out all the stuff. That, Children of the Corn, yeah, uh, From yeah, Dust Till Dawn. J- yeah, all, the, all just the sort of the, the standard uh, routine stuff that just sort of has to be out there to have a presence, but which isn't really the A-list stuff, doesn't need special handling. And so all they're doing is taking the original masters from, uh, from Buena Vista, from Disney, uh, and they're just releasing pretty much the same stuff. This is all exactly the same DVD quality that you already have. If you already own this, there's no reason to upgrade. If you don't have it, it's available again. Uh, the Kid, you probably completely forgot about this, uh, directed by John Hamilton. This is a uh, kind of a, a kid's Rocky slash Raging Bull uh, thing. Noteworthy only because it has an interesting uh, performance by Rod Steiger in it. Um, also out is The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, which is much more recent, directed by Julian Schnabel, who we just talked about. And uh, this is a terrific film, and I'm not quite sure why this one was uh, given to Echo Bridge. That sort of surprises me, frankly. I would have expected a, a higher-profile release of this, but silly Also me. Blu-ray. Of that. Yeah, and it's Blu-ray. beautifully shot. Well, the Blu-rays are coming very infrequently from, uh, from Echo Max, Bridge. Guys, yeah, yeah. Uh, A Rage in Harlem, uh, kind of a silly film, actually. Uh, this was uh, directed by Bill Duke, who, of course, is a very successful actor. But it was this is kind of like you know, let's tell the story of uh, Harlem gangsters from the point of view of uh, of you know black Harlem gangsters. Uh, this is all right, you know. Uh, it's got Robin Givens in it. I don't know what happened to her. Smoke Signals uh, was a big deal at Sundance, and then did absolutely zero at the box office. Uh, this is all about uh, Native Americans and life on the reservation and leaving the reservation and. 
uh, you know, it's, it's got a real Sundancey feel, but that also did not do great at the box office. Welcome to Sarajevo, the uh, Michael Winterbottom film uh, that was at the Cannes Film Festival in 1992. Ooh, so, uh, so we love Michael Winterbottom. We love Michael Winterbottom. Uh, I already talked about the 1992 Cannes Film Festival previously, and yes, this was another one from that uh, same selection. And this is a great film. Uh, again, I, I think this, if this had been a, a bigger hit at the box office, it also would not necessarily be in this bunch. But this is a really good film, and if, you don't, if you've never seen it, now is the time to see it. It's all about journalists in Sarajevo during the Balkan War. Uh, Woody Harrelson and Marissa Tomei are very good in it, but it's basically Stephen Delane's movie. Stephen Delane is magnificent in this film, and it is, uh, it's, it's really very timely, almost more timely now than it was at the uh, time of its release. Stephen Freer's very brilliant Dirty Pretty Things is also part of this batch. Good uh, movie. This batch. Oh, such a good movie. Uh, Chibotal Edgia 4 is fantastic. Audrey Tautou is fantastic. This is uh, a, a gritty, dangerous, tough movie about illegal immigrants in uh, London working in the hotel industry. And uh, it is, uh, it's just fabulous. Audrey Tautou plays a Turkish immigrant. Um, uh, Chiwet Lejifor plays a Nigerian immigrant. And uh, it, it really is an excellent, excellent film. Beautifully directed. Uh, just terrific character stuff. Love it. This is a great film. Uh, Restoration, Mark. You fan of Restoration? Uh, Restoration Hardware? I kind of go back and forth on this. Michael Hoffman, who I normally like a lot as a director, uh, did this. And this is back. This is, uh, this is Meg Ryan uh, pre-plastic uh, surgery. It, yeah, it's... Oh, don't say that. This is Meg Ryan and Robert Downey Jr. incredibly miscast in a gorgeous, in an otherwise gorgeous film that is all about the restoration period. If you don't know that, I'm not going to give you a history lesson, uh, <laughs> but it is about the restoration of the monarchy in England. And uh, how it sort of changed everything, how it set the stage, helped set the stage for the Renaissance and a lot of other things. It is, uh, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous film. This won a couple of Academy Awards, actually, for costume design and art direction in 1996. Surprisingly, I think it came out of left field. Um, another film that Miramax didn't give a great degree of support to, but it is actually a very, very good film. I almost feel like I want to watch this again. I haven't seen this in a while. I should watch it again. But boy, I'll tell you, Meg Ryan, Ryan and Robert Downey Jr. are incredibly miscast. David Thewlis, uh, by the way, from Naked also shows up in this. He's cool. He is cool. Four Rooms, uh, boy, this was a misfire. Uh, four Rooms were, was a film, four separate films that all take place in different rooms in the same hotel. Each is a little film directed by Alison Anders, Alexander Rockwell, Robert Rodriguez, and Quentin Tarantino. Two of those people are still relevant filmmakers. Uh, and it's sad because Alison Anders is terrific but the movie itself unbelievably uneven Marissa Tomei bops into this as well and there's a whole ton of people I mean it's a huge cast and they show off Madonna on the uh, packaging but uh, you know it's a, it's a it's a the only person who is uh, in all of them is Tim Roth as the uh, the bellboy the uh, you know whatever you call him the bellhop he's the only one that shows up in all of them I, I don't know it's, it was a cute idea but it just did not work um the last batch here, Full Frontal, Steven Soderbergh film. Uh, oh, yeah. That I actually, you know, he, sh- he shot this just like with... That's like one of his first, that, that's one of his first one for me, one for them films. Yeah, it was. I thought there's a lot of great stuff in this and a lot of really uneven stuff. Uh, I'm, um, I, I, I should probably watch it again because I, I have very fond recollection of it, but I, you know, like Nicky Cat is hysterical. In this. Oh yeah, Nicky Cat, who who is just such an underrated character actor, he he's playing Hitler in this weird stage play somewhere out in the hinterlands of Los Angeles. It's outra- his stuff is outrageously funny. The uh, the Julia Roberts stuff uh, and uh, with Blair Underwood, I'm a little less uh, impressed by. But uh, a very interesting experimental film from uh, Steven Soderbergh. Very very uh, Catherine Keener. I remember being very good in this too. Um, Glory Days uh, Gads Forget about this one This is just a Real misfire Yeah This oh. is not uh... Sam Rockwell uh, Ben Affleck Way too young It's just this. Wow This thing came and went And deservedly uh, Forget about this Bury it Not worth watching So, Byron, gl- so Byron to burn That'd be a Burn burden. that one D- Glory Days D-A-Z-E an Ideal Husband is fabulous. This is an unbelievably great film. Uh, it has fallen between the cracks. Oliver Parker, who's a very successful stage director, did a, uh, a great film adaptation of uh, Twelfth Night some years before this, directed this beautiful adaptation of, um, of uh, Oscar Wilde's famous play, 
an ideal husband. And it is wonderful. It's a great cast. Uh, Kate Blanchett, uh, Rupert Everett, Minnie Driver, Jeremy Northam, Julianne Moore. It is delightful. It is funny. It is true to the source material. You, if you haven't seen it, you got to get it. Oh, another Freer's film, The Grifters, which everybody really fond of. Uh, Jim Thompson uh, wrote the novel, and uh, Scorsese produced this. And it's... Uh, you know what? It, it's a. I love. Oh, this is a great movie. It's a great movie. It really I'm is. I'm just surprised that this is not getting the uh, special edition treatment. That's the thing too. I, I I'm really shocked that they're just kind of spitting this one out without uh, really, really. I, I don't think that the current owners of the Miramax Library, Ron Tudor and his partners, I don't think they really know what they have. I don't think they really know how to exploit this library. They are missing opportunities here, like left and right. I agree. You know I mean, what? honestly, I'm looking at some of these titles, and I'm just thinking, really, you're just you're just taking the the original masters from Disney, and you're just re- reissuing that Blu-ray, and just do, not even on Blu-ray. Look at that, like reissuing it on DVD, and just doing nothing else with it. Yep, that's it. Terrible. Uh, Little Buddha was a horrible misfire by Bernardo Bertolucci, who had been on board to do a version, a biopic about the Buddha based on a script by Robert Bolt, which I have read, by the way. Oh, the again Robert, with Robert Again with Robert Bolt. Bolt. And uh, nobody has yet made the Bolt screenplay, even though it is positively brilliant. I, ju- I just don't know what the problem is. Like, Jason Lee was the last one attached to, to star in that. They had uh, uh, Godfrey, uh, what's his name? Gilbert Godfrey? No, uh, the, the, the cinematographer, the Koyana Scotsi guy, Godfrey Fricky. Oh, Godfrey Reggio. Frick, Godfrey Reggio was going to direct it, and that went nowhere. Uh, anyway, so Bertolucci went and made his own film with uh, Keanu Reeves, which is just, just terrible. Little Duda. It's te- Little Duda is what they called it. It's just terrible. Why would he do that? Uh, beautifully shot, but my gosh, Keanu Reeves is horrible on this. So that's out again. Albino Alligator, directed by Kevin Spacey, who is currently on big screen as, uh, a, as the psycho boss in uh, Horrible Bosses. Um, this is Kevin Spacey doing a little noir, and uh, it's okay. It ain't great, uh, but it's, Gary Sinise is very good in it. Matt Dillon, Faye Dunaway, also star. Uh, Beautiful Girls, also with Matt Dillon, and a terrific cast of, uh, of lovelies, except for uh, Rosie O'Donnell, who I just can't tolerate on screen anymore because she's just loud and obnoxious. But it also got Uma Thurman, Mira Sorvino, Michael Rappaport, uh, Lauren Holly, Natalie Portman. Quite nice. Not a great film. Cute film. Uh, directed by the now-deceased and very, very missed Ted Demi. That is true. That's unfortunate. And then Christopher Lambert with bleached hair doing a version of Beowulf that never got a theatrical release, and rightfully so. It's just silly straight-to-video crap. But uh, it's better than the 3D motion capture Robert Zemeckis Beowulf, which is just an absolutely horrible abortion. And then lastly, uh, Echo Bridge also threw a bunch of these things at us. Uh, These are compilation packages. Uh, These are non-Miramax films, but the Doll series, Demonic Dolls, Dangerous Worry Dolls, and Doll Graveyard along with uh, the 10 Movie Kids Pack, which is just a whole bunch of stuff that uh, they already have in their library. It's all family film stuff like Undercover Angel, Pony Express, Rider. Again, it's summertime, good uh, babysitting material. Sit the kids down, go play tennis or play doctor or whatever else it is you're going to do. Uh, with that, we're going we're gonna to finish some of this other stuff next week. We've got some great foreign titles and some great television titles that we will uh, we'll dive into next week. But we are running out of time right now. So, Mark, uh, we're uh, any anything else on your horizon other than stupid for movies? Uh, no, but we're going to find out next week which which uh, which season which season one TV series. Yes. Uh, did I go out with their script supervisor? Oh, really? I went out with the script supervisor. A couple S- dates. I like yeah. she's really cute, but uh. she didn't like me in the end. Uh, uh. Of an NBC show that has since been canceled and is now on DVD. Well, that'll who, be. Who would that be? Ooh, that's... What what canceled NBC show? Did Mark date the script supervisor? Oh, what a tease for What a tease week. that is. And she was cute.